Thank you very much, Tuan, for the wonderful invitation to speak. And I'm only sorry that I can't be there in person to engage with you and the audience. Um, but I'll do my best to try and to um, to speak with uh, some liveliness and, and keep us engaged over the next half hour or so. Um, there's three little stories in this presentation, and hopefully I'll get through all three. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about some point of care work we're doing on lateral flow assays, and then move into some work we're doing on using stimulated Raman scattering for the analysis of um, live cells, and in particular, some of the probe molecules that we've been designing using some synthetic chemistry. So I'll just move on to the, the first um, story, which is our lateral flow cells. We've got quite a lot of activity going on in this area. Um, I guess lateral flow assays are quite um, rec well recognised from obviously the pregnancy testing to begin with, but now with the, the COVID um, pandemic, lateral flow assays have been, ex well, been used um, extensively for the, the testing for the, um, the virus and also some infectivity. So we were working on lateral flow assays um, prior to, to COVID, and we were using the advantages of SERS, which is surface enhanced Raman scattering, because we get an enhancement from the metal particles used to give that colorimetric line in the lateral flow assays. So we have a collaboration um, which is funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council and also a collaboration funded by the Medical Research Council in the UK to look at lateral flow assays for antimicrobial resistance and also for drug-induced liver injury at the point of care. Those two programmes are ongoing at the moment. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about a side project which has emerged from these collaborations on the detection of C. diff, which is a, an infection which is of interest to clinicians and they really wanted to have an ultra-sensitive way of detecting this at the point of care. So this is uh, the team um, at Strathclyde, which is Professor Karen Falls and, and Walid Hassanain, who are uh, my colleagues at Strathclyde. And then in Newcastle, we have Dr. Neil Keegan and Dr. Chris Johnson. And we've been working on this as a team for the last two years. So C. diff is uh, an infection, a bacterial infection of the bowel, which can cause some pretty unpleasant um, outcomes. It's currently diagnosed using sequential testing. We can have a GDH antigen and toxins A and B, and there is a, a commercially available um, lateral flow test where we can pick out for antigens for the, um, the GDH or for the, the toxins, and you can look for your two lines to, to see if that's present. The problem is this is a qualitative test, it's not quantitative. There is an issue with cross-reactivity. Um, cross-reactivity, um, and also it's an expensive test to run. So the, the market for C. difficile treatment is going to increase from about 630 million in 2016 to 1.7 billion in 2026. So it's an area which is of definite growth. Now the approach that we're going to take here is to look at a new marker for C. diff, which is the surface layer protein. And our collaborators at Newcastle published this paper in 2018, where they showed that the um, surface layer protein was abundant and found in all C. difficile strains that had been sequenced. However, the issue that they found was the conventional ELISA produced an LOD of 12.4 picograms per microliter, which was not low enough for clinical use. Therefore, we had the idea that if we could come up with a lateral flow assay using surface enhanced Raman scattering to boost the sensitivity of the lateral flow assay, we could maybe improve the limit of detection and make this surface layer protein a viable marker for use in the detection of C. difficile. We also wanted to pick out the toxins. We wanted to do a, a, a double detection on our lateral flow strip, um, looking at endotoxins A and B, although B is the toxin which is essential for the virulence of the C. difficile. So to make the SERS assay, we generated some functionalized nanoparticles. These are spherical gold nanoparticles of about 60 nanometers. 
We functionalize them with the antibody just through passive absorption. We fill in the gaps on the surface with BSA, and we use a Raman reporter molecule, malachite green isothiocyanate. So in this case, we can make a tag, a Raman tag, um, from the nanoparticles with for the surface layer protein. And then we can take a second nanoparticle with a different antibody, and we're going to use the same Raman tag because we're going to have separate lines in our lateral flow strip with the antibody towards toxin B. We can then mix these nanoparticles together, incubate them with the target, and then run them up in a dipstick format along the um, nitrocellulose membrane. And then we're going to use handheld Raman spectroscopy to detect our um, nanoparticles in the, the test lines and we have a control line. And the idea here is that we'll get sensitivity back because of the signal and we should be able to see the SER signal when it's no longer visible. And we should be able to also quantify the amount of signal we're getting back, which will give us an indication of how much of the surface layer protein or toxin B is there. So that's the, the concept. Here's the examples um, in terms of the um, surface layer protein and toxin B. So we can see this is the test line for the surface layer protein, which is the, the test line. And I have faith probably see about 25 picograms per microliter for the surface layer protein. And for the visual detection of the toxin B, we're probably cutting out about 100 to maybe 50 mic, uh, picograms per microliter. If, however, we measure the Raman spectroscopy of these lines away from where we can't see anything, we can still see clearly detectable signals down to quite low levels of our um, surface layer protein and toxin B. And we can get down to 0 0.01 picograms per microliter, which is about a 4,000 to 10,000 improvement over the visual, visual um, limits of detection and also provides us some quantitation, as you can see the linearity between the concentration and the Raman intensity. So we had some good information um, obtained from these preliminary experiments. We wanted to ensure that they were reproducible and that there was um, selectivity between the two different antibodies. So in this experiment, we um, held the Sorry, we looked at the concentration of the surface layer protein at two different levels and did similar for toxin B, and we could see pretty good RSDs across the, the uh, lateral flow. And then we could look at the control um, where we had a surface layer protein negative control or a toxin B negative control, and we couldn't see any cross reactivity. So that was encouraging in terms of ensuring that the signal that we're measuring is coming from the target that we're looking for in the lateral flow assay. And then we moved into the, the duplex detection. So we, we held the toxin B at 400 picograms and then varied the surface layer protein concentration and then did the same in holding the surface layer protein concentration and varying the toxin B concentration. And these are the bar charts of the intensities coming back from the two different lines. And we can see that the toxin B in this case is consistent or constant. And we can see uh, a drop off in the intensity as the, the concentration of the surface layer protein is dropped. And similarly, we can see the same for the toxin B as that is dropped. So working in a duplex was encouraging. We then moved on to the clinical matrix. Um, now, typically these are measured in stool samples. We were doing this in the middle of lockdown. We weren't able to travel to our clinical collaborators in Newcastle to send samples, clinical samples from Newcastle to Scotland was actually incredibly challenging from a paperwork and safety perspective. So in the end, we used a synthetic stool um, mimic of the original stool. And we could see here that when we spiked in the, the surface layer protein and the toxin B, we could get pretty good correlation between what had been spiked in and, excuse me, what we were measuring. So this was good evidence that we could use the um, lateral flow approach with the SERS to improve the sensitivity down below the 12.4 picograms per microliter that had been reported by ELISA to move it into a clinically relevant range um, and we could get quantitation now. So 
The next step and what we're working on at the moment and now that things are opening up again in the UK, um, will lead us travelling down to Newcastle in the next two weeks with the handheld spectrometer to run a series of clinical samples to now test this methodology out in the real, um, I guess, clinical environment rather than using our synthetic stool samples. So from this part, we can say that we can detect um, C. difficile biomarkers, surface layer protein and tox B within 20 minutes of applying the sample, well, from taking the sample to getting the, the results. Um, we're down to about 0 0.01 picograms per microliter. It's a duplex measurement of toxin B and surface layer protein with good reproducibility and selectivity. And we think that this is going to be quite useful in the hands of the clinicians if we can get this into a affordable and readily available format. Because at the moment, we're still using our handheld Raman with interpretation by Raman spectroscopists. So there, there's still a little bit of a gap between taking it from the Raman spectroscopist into the hands of the clinicians. But that's something that we need to work on going forward. So I just want to move into the second area that I want to talk about, which is alkyne tagged Raman imaging. So we're now going to move away from surface enhanced Raman imaging and use um, stimulated Raman scattering. And we're going to combine stimulated Raman scattering with some novel probes. And this is now a collaboration with Will Tipping, who's a postdoc in our group, with Nick Tomkinson, who's an organic chemist, Simon Mackay, who's a medicinal chemist, and Liam Wilson, who's an excellent organic chemistry PhD, who made a huge number of molecules for use in SRS imaging of cells during his PhD. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're all familiar with spontaneous Raman, stimulated Raman, we're going to take a probe beam and we're going to take, sorry, a probe beam and we're going to take a Stokes beam and we're going to tune the difference in energy between them to equal one of the frequencies of a vibration that we want to probe. And we can change this energy difference to suit the different vibrations. The advantage of this is that we have minimal sample preparation because it's direct detection onto our sample. It's very fast, um, almost up to video rate. I'll show you some images. Um, we've, we've taken single cells or multiple cells in matters of seconds. It's quantitative. Um, the downside, I guess, is that you're looking at one frequency at a time. You're not getting a full spectrum back, but it is still um, pretty advantageous compared to normal Raman mapping of biological cells in terms of the speed. I'm not going to talk about cars. We have done some cars work, but we are predominantly focused on SRS. To go with this, I think it's important that we look at the Raman spectroscopy of a biological cell just to see what um, chemical aspects we're looking at here. So we've got the normal fingerprint region where we've got the um, carbonyls, um, methylene groups, DNA, phenylalanine, phosphates from DNA. We've got the high wave number region for our CH2s and CH3s, which will be important for some of our SRS imaging. We've got this cell silent region, which is where we're going to apply our chemistry. I'm not going to talk about any deuterated work. We have got deuterated work we've done, but I haven't uh, we haven't finalised that yet. We're going to focus today on acetylenes and how we can modify acetylenes to work with SRS to provide biological information from single cells, multiple cells. Um, and we're not going to talk about night trials, although there is a night trial functionality in one of the probes that we've made. Right, this is a little bit of a busy slide. Um, the idea here was that we wanted to make molecules which would have uh, an alkyne vibration, so in the cell silent region, that would change frequency in different environments. And the first different environment we wanted to examine was a change in pH. So the idea here is that we take uh, an acetylene-based molecule. We know from literature that if we have aromatic systems either side of the acetylene, we get a very high Raman cross-section. A bisacetylene gives a stronger signal than a single acetylene. So we made bisacetylene aryl diaryl di diines, and then we added our functional group, which is pH responsive. And you can see here, we've tried to indicate the, the pH range, which we've covered with all the different chemical moieties. So we can use a phenolic group when we're moving towards the basic um, side of the PhD, of the, the pH scale. 
and we can use amine groups um, for protonation when we move to the acidic side of the, the pH scale. I'm just going to focus in on this molecule here, which is the difluorophenolic bisacetylene. And we can see here that um, its pKa is about 6.2, so this is going to be good for physiological range. And we can see there's a change um, when it's protonated to deprotonated of about 7.8 or 8 wave numbers. So we're going to look at this change in the frequency of the acetylene as we change the pH environment. This is just going to show you some of the ex-cellular work which has gone on here. So here's the uh, bisacetylene drawn out. Um, when it's protonated, the, the frequency is 2,221. When it's deprotonated, it's 2,010. So we can see the different bands that we get back here from the Raman spectrum at the different pHs. If we start to ratio the intensity of the 2,021 band to 2,010, we can start to get a short pH calibration graph here. So we can now work out through the ratio of intensity, the protonation state of this molecule, which then correlates back to the pH that this molecule is within. Now, the advantage of this is that these probes are very photostable. They um, remain where they end up within the intracellular environment, and they're not similar to broad fluorescence emissions. These are very sharp, narrow um, bands, which have um, you know, this is only 20 wave numbers we're talking about here, this whole scale here. So this um, shows you some of the early work that we've done, where we took a cell and we treated it with the topocide, which induces apoptosis. And we could see that the pH of the cell dropped initially. And then when we stopped treating with the topocide, it started to recover again and the pH started to increase. And then we can look at the SRS imaging of the cell where we could see the, um, this is the, the CH3 band from the proteins and lipids, which remains reasonably constant. 2,851 is a CH2 um, from lipids. And then this is the acetylene from the sensor. And what we're showing here is that the pH sensor is fairly uniformly distributed in the cytoplasm that doesn't go into the nucleus. And then this is the off-resonance contribution, um, just to show that we're not getting any off-resonance effects. So this allowed us to then go on and to think about what else we could do with the acetylenes. I'm going to come back to the pH sensing. So this was just reporting the probes and our ability to use pH um, measurements with SRS. We wanted to look and see if there was any other chemistry that we could do. And um, this is just a quick aside in terms of fluoride ion sensing. Um, fluoride ion sensing is important for gastric or kidney issues, and also it can be released when you've had um, chemical weapons such as sarin or soman present because they are um, phosphorus fluorine bonds which can be broken and release the fluoride. So we have this sensor which we've made this time, which is a, a nitrile aromatic um, tri trimethyl silyl acetylene, where we have the alkyne stretch at 2162 and the nitrile at 2231. So quite distinctly different. When we treat or we remove the TMS group, which is susceptible to fluoride cleavage, then we see a change in the alkyne frequency, but we don't see a change in the nitrile. So this gives us an ability to ratio the nitrile to the alkyne to um, determine how much change has taken place but also we can look at the change in frequency, which is a huge change in frequency this time, and um, to determine how much of the fluoride ion is present. And this is just showing you the Raman spectroscopy of the um, sensor with the fluoride, without the fluoride, and then just THF on its own. Now, TBAF, tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride, is the normal reagent which is used for removing TMS groups in chemistry. So we were treating, we, we actually created these filter papers with the sensor. We then immersed them in fluoride solutions and we analyzed the, the ratio of the, the two bands to tell us how much fluoride ion was, was present. So this is just a quick, um, I guess, digression to show you that we can do fluoride sensing. We've targeted a little bit of the medical applications, but in reality, it's probably quite useful for organic chemistry. Although when we were doing this in, our, in a reaction, mechanism, a reaction vessel, 
we actually had to add more and more water to slow it down because the reaction was happening so quickly, it was challenging to get enough data points out to give us accurate um, measurements. So this is just another example of how alkynes can be useful for detection. But really where I was wanting to get to in this part of the talk was into the, the mitochondrial pH. Um, so we've designed this molecule, which we're calling mitokine. And mitokine um, is the alkyne sensor with the pH ionizable group, the phenolic um, group, one fluorine this time. And we've added a head group, which we're calling um, our mitochondrial targeting group. But it's well known that triphenylphosphonium ions will target the mitochondria. Many commercial tags are made with these um, functional groups. So we combined our triphenylphosphonium targeting group with the alkyne sensing of the pH to see if we could understand more about pH changes in mitochondria. And this is just going through the, the same sort of characterization again of showing you the pH and the shifts in the, the band frequency. And then also we can do the titration in with the pKa um, to give us a pKa of 7.9 here. And also then an increase as we add the amount of, sorry, we, we change the amount of base, we can change the protonation state. Now this is quite a busy slide, so I will uh, attempt to go through it quite carefully. We have, in this set of experiments, we're starving the cells of um, nutrients, and we're expecting the mitochondria to react to this change in the nutrients. So our control um, experiment here, where we've not done anything to it, and now we're looking at the, the bands changing in the alkyne, so we're looking for pH changes, and we can see the pH dropping in the mitochondria as we are starving the cells of nutrients. So we expect this to happen. So that was good evidence that we were seeing intracellular pH changes as in response to the nutrient starvation. In this panel B, we're showing the alkyne um, frequency over time. This is now LISA tracker. Uh, LISA tracker is commercially available fluorescent dye, which allows us to map where the uh, lysosomes are within the cell. And the ability of our microscope is that we can measure SRS and fluorescence on the same sample. So we could do a fluorescence image and a SERS image and then merge the two. And what we're looking at in the merged image is the correlation between the, the location of the lysosome and the mitokine based on the mitotracker or the mitokine, sorry. And we can see that they become more correlated as we starve the cells. And what we think is happening here is that as we starve the cells, the lysosomes start to engage with the, mitoch the mitochondria and start to degrade and engulf the mitochondria, um, destroying them. So we can see this through the, the merged image using the, the, ly the lyso tracker and the alkyne from the, the mitokine that we've produced. And then this is just using the other commercial available dye, which is a mito tracker and correlating it with the mitokine to show that we are getting good correlation between where the mitokine goes and where the commercially available mito tracker shows it should go. So this is basically saying that we've got a, a probe now which works with SRS in single cells, which allows us to look at um, the location of the, the probe in mitochondria. We can see changes in the mitochondrial pH as we're changing the environment. And we can also get some evidence about other um, subcellular organelles that are in, uh, interacting with the mitochondria as it's starving. Now, I'm conscious that I've got basically two minutes left. So I'm gonna go very quickly through this one, which is just looking at statin therapy in breast cancer patients. And what we've done here is we've taken two standard um, statins, one hydrophobic, one hydrophilic, looked at three different cancer cell lines, which are here, which have got different levels of lipids, and then treated them with the statins, and again, analyzed them by SRS. This paper has just come out last week in chemical science. And what we've done there is we've applied spectral phaser analysis, which allows us to combine multiple images where we've change the frequency that we're looking at by about six wave numbers to build up a pseudo SRS spectrum. And then we can segment the images from the phaser analysis to pick out regions of correlation, which allow us to be very accurate in terms of um, 
the amount of lipid, lipid membrane, et cetera, that we're seeing in here. And the take home message from this is, I'll skip that one, is that the, um, the statins do behave differently with three different cell lines. The MCF7s induce more lipids and have less, out of, less um, toxicity from the atifostatin. Um, as, and you can see this is just the lipid buildup. And the next slide just shows you the, the toxicity is much less for the MCF7s compared to the two other cancer cell lines from breast cancer, which are different ER um, alpha status. And we think, if you read the paper, because I don't have time to talk about it now, that the, the, there is a correlation between the um, estrogen receptor status and the ability of statins to have an effect on breast cancer cells and their susceptibility to treatment by statins. So that was a very quick, and apologies for rushing through that last little bit. Um, I am going to stop now because I think I'm out of time. I think hopefully I've shown you that SERS has a place to play in enhancing the sensitivity of lateral flow assays. We've shown it for C. difficile, it's obviously transferable into many other areas. And the SRS is offering opportunities for fast live cell imaging. And you can combine that with lots of new chemical probes for tags and to study new areas of interest. Many areas that we're working on at the moment, funded by these people. Thank you for listening and apologies for going on just a little bit longer than I'd hoped.